Good morning. How are you? Um, Hope you're good. As you know from the class website, the plan for today would have been to introduce for the first time the next digital app we're going to work on for the next three weeks, which is Evernote, and go through the first demo of Evernote. In fact, I'm behind with the programs from the Monday's classes when we go through the readings. So I will complete my presentation of Google, which is overdue, was listed on Monday of last week. I will go through the notes about chapter two of the textbook entitled, What is the History of Knowledge? So that we can catch up and I can comfortably do that and start my demo of Evernote on Friday because Evernote of the three digital tools that will be introduced, presented, and used in this class is by far the most user-friendly, the easier to use, and also the lightest in terms of its intellectual value and intellectual usefulness for projects related to knowledge. Very agile though, very practical, very convenient to the point where some uh, so-called gurus of self-help and productivity have tried Notion and then went back to Evernote for a variety of reasons. If you remember, I also still have to go through a couple of things from my demo on Notion, which I'll do on Friday. Um, the only announcement would be that, rest assured, I'm going through the homework assignments. Every day I'm doing at least about 10. So by Thursday, by tomorrow, or Friday, depending on how, how bad tomorrow is in terms of other engagements, I'll be able to correct all of the assignments. So if you haven't found my comments, my grades on your assignments that were due last week, the two assignments, the Notion page showcasing some of the basic and intermediate features, and the assignment, the first written assignment on Google, on, sorry, on my digital life, Google will be the next one. Just wait and I'll get to you. And otherwise, if you haven't checked on your Notion pages or the alerts from your Notion pages, go and check and see if the grade is there, if the comments are there. And in fact, it might be useful because I might have left some questions for you to respond to, okay? As far as I am concerned, when you leave a message inside the Notion page for me, especially when you use the handle Andrea Fedi, then I do receive a notification even on my phone, but it's not like my email where I'm always connected, I'm always there, and therefore I respond as soon as possible if I'm not in a meeting. In the case of any conversation going on between you and me on Notion, I'll check that normally once a day. So you might have to wait for 24 hours before I respond to that. If you need a quicker kind of response, then switch from the Notion comments to email, and I'll see that right away and uh, see to it as quickly as possible, okay? So on Monday, we talked about Google and introduce some general principles, some general ideas about Google. And I'll continue to go through this presentation. Keep in mind that this presentation, which is linked in the class website, also includes more notes in some instances. So you're supposed to review these bullet points, but also find those slightly more extensive notes and read them as you would with a reading. I place their excerpts from two books in particular, one about Google, the other about Lego and small data. 
keep in mind that those are also part of your readings. You're responsible for those as well. On Monday, one of the last things we discussed was that Google started as yet another example of crowdsourcing because their organization of content leveraged the existence of links and that gave them a way to produce a hierarchy of relevance for the information that the user was looking for. But eventually, within a few years, they came to the realization that their business was not, as it seemed initially, the contents of the internet, which they transferred and stored and archived on their servers. Their core business is the users themselves and collecting information about the patterns of use, about the searches of the users, so that they could sell that information to commercial companies who are going to advertise products that are tailored on your searches, right? Have you ever had the experience of looking for information on a digital camera and you're looking for reviews or videos and then all you see when you access your browser when there is dynamic ads displayed on a page are in fact ads for a digital camera and what will happen is that even after you purchase one that will continue to pester you with those ads because of course they can really spy on your computer and see that you have acquired one already. Of course, it's, it's even worse than that. If you've ever tried to, if you have an Android phone, mention a product a few times, and then you may have noticed that that product appears in the ads that has been tested. Uh, even, even I did a home test and it turned out positive there is good indication that your phone is listening on your conversations without recording anything but certain keywords. And those keywords, of course, include the names of commercial products. So if you have a prolonged conversation about a certain kind of sneaker, then you might see sneakers or even sneakers from that particular company in your ads, right? And again, they will have plausible deniability legally when they say we're not listening, we're not collecting data, simply because they add modifiers, simply because they're not, it's all about what is, is, what is means, right? To use the famous defense by Clinton, who was of course guilty, and Google is guilty as well, only they do it in a way that is legal and they have plausible deniability they don't associate those keywords with your name as they could but they still build a data set that a third party or third party software would be able to associate with your address and therefore with your household and most of the time 90 percent of the time with your name and, and multiple companies are doing this, right? Anytime you visit a website, someone is tracking what you click on, what you look at, how long you look at it, etc., etc. So I'm not going to go through all the bullet points or read everything because you can do it yourself. So I'm just going to illuminate some points so that you can use them as leverage when you approach these as reading. So in, in the case of knowledge, the, the simple thing, you, you have various sections, well, what is information, what is scientific knowledge, what are the various levels of information, what are the various levels of knowledge, right? You have the most trivial bit of information, the schedule of a train that goes from Hong Kong to Penn Station that you get out of Google, or the uh, equivalency of the euro in dollars for today, right? Or when a flight is landing from Los Angeles in uh, Kennedy or LaGuardia Airport in the city to the highest level of knowledge, right? Whereby you find, depending on the scale, the orders of knowledge you uh, uh, traver traverse, 
the highest level might be philosophy, right? Information about your essence as a human being, or the highest level might be meta knowledge. That is to say, a collection of articles about scientific articles. You know that some scientific, even medical research uh, articles and projects are performed by entering data from all the articles that have been done. Let's say you, you take COVID, you enter in a database all the articles on COVID, and then instead of writing an article or doing a research on COVID itself through lab data, you use the knowledge in those articles to extrapolate patterns. There would be meta-knowledge. From the philosophical side, know yourself would be the highest, or uh, why do we exist would be the highest level of knowledge. On the scientific side, meta-knowledge, knowledge built on databases of uh, analyzed data, not raw data, would be the highest level of knowledge. However, right, even though we understand this, and we can define what we find, the content, right? If I take any kind of content that I access from Google, I can place it on this scale. I can say this is basic information. I can say this is information that is organized. I can say this is information that is produced by analysis. I can say this is information that is the result of analysis of knowledge that analyze data, right? However, even though I can place, I can define, I can write knowledge, when, as a user, I click and access information through Google, everything is information. That's why Google is useful and useless at the same time. And again, the best, most, the easiest to understand a kind of example is, once again, can you diagnose your illness from Google, even though you find thousands of medical blogs, thousands of uh, medical articles, you find pages from hospitals uh, talking about any kind of disease, diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, etc. Can you diagnose yourself? No, you cannot. You can't. Why? Because what is missing is the process that your medical assistant, your doctor, your nurse practitioner will go through to first really identify the symptoms. Because not everything is going on in your body is a symptom, right? It's the semantics of biology. Then you have to connect those symptoms in a meaningful way. Right? Because some symptoms might be primary, others might be secondary. Okay? So I don't understand what is going on unless I realize whether the problem is your lungs or the problem is your brain uh, not issuing the correct uh, impulses, the correct instructions to your respiratory system. Right? Etc. Etc. So, why is everything I find on the internet kind of flat? And the same is true for Wikipedia. And, and we'll eventually, at the end of the semester, talk about Wikipedia a lot, which is incredibly powerful, but everything is really flat. There is a hierarchy, but everything appears to be flat and entropic and exploded. Inside Google, everything is information, because if you just click once, twice, three times, to get to a piece of information. It doesn't matter where you place it in the scale of knowledge, right? Human knowledge, scientific knowledge, knowledge of a humanist kind. It doesn't matter what level it is. When you approach it as a user, it is just information. Because there is no difference epistemologically from saying, the Earth is flat, which is wrong, sorry. I don't know if you are, belong to one of those groups. The Earth is, is not flat. And saying the Earth is round, there is no difference if those are just pieces of information for you. Meaning, if you're not able to process what you're saying in that statement, if you're not able to place it within an organized 
system of knowledge that is just information, whether it's right or wrong. And in fact, it's a kind of an extreme example, but basically, we all say the Earth is round because we believe whoever told us. Uh, our science teacher in middle school, or uh, the teacher in primary school, or an article from the New York Times, a video from NASA, right? We just believe that, and we don't go through the process. It's just something we believe to be true, but it's just information. And the same is true for anything else that you find in the internet. Unless you already have a mental process, unless you already have a mental network, which would be what we call knowledge, or better yet, expertise, what you acquire is just information. So even if you are looking for a self-diagnosis and you find the best, deepest, uh, the result of the best research in an article on the illness that you actually suffer from, it'll just be information to you unless you have medical knowledge. Because if you have medical knowledge, then that piece of information is not only placed somewhere, but where you place it is not a castle. It's not a fixed structure. It's a structure that is dynamic, that is made of processes. Because the moment you acquire that information, what is that you do? If it is new medical information, if there is anyone here in the health sciences, and you read some new piece of medical information, information about the body, about the metabolism, about illness or sickness. What is that you do? You don't place it in your, just in your memory, right? Which is the process that was used in education during the 20th century to go back to the beginning of this particular presentation where, where students just memorized everything and regurgitated everything in a, a, a report, exam, uh, etc. No, you don't just place it in your memory. What is that you do when you read some new kind of information, even randomly from, from the internet, not in a class? What is that you do? Crickets. Oh, you oh, learners, what is that you do when you have new information? What happens in your head? Max. Pardon? Contextualize it. You contextualize it. Good. Which means? Which means? Expand that. Uh, trying to figure out how it relates to other things. Like exactly. Other how it relates to other things. You connect it. And the moment you start connecting it, that's the neural network that is creating something different. That's the process that gives value to that kind of knowledge and places it somewhere in a scale. But lacking that context, lacking that process that allows you to connect it to other things of meaning, it's just information. From that point of view, the fact that the LA flight from California that uh, left at 6 a.m. is landing at uh, noon in New York, or the secret of the universe, the existence of God, uh, the uh, secret to machine learning or uh, the, the understanding of the genome are, to, are all flat, are all information. And therefore, they don't have any different kind of value if you don't possess the expertise to start connecting it. Now, this is the first part of my reasoning, right? Because if this were the internet, then the 1990s would call and say, we want our web back. No, the internet was more successful and is more successful than that because what is that best approximates the construction of a process of connections, right? for lack of a better term, but we could extrapolate and expand on that. What is that approximate that kind of process during the internet experience, including Google? Connection. 
connections, the internet. How does the internet work? The internet is a network, right? A network of computers, but it's not just the computers, the servers that are connected. What is that gives value to the internet? People that use it? No, material. What is that you find there? It's not just, I have a page in front of me, as if I were flipping through the pages and then I read this one, page 221. There is more that I find on the internet all the time. Which is also what <coughs> we said before, even Wikipedia is kind of flat. However, even Wikipedia is still the, one of the top 10 websites in the world, right? What is the redeeming value? <coughs> Where can the redeeming value of Wikipedia be found? And the same for, for the internet. What is that adds value to the, what, what we define as information of different levels, but still kind of flat, what gives it additional value? The database, the link? The link, links, links, connection, links, links. That's the thing. Because when you have a link, right, when you, what you're reading has links, then the moment you start reading, unless you're an expert, there is no process in your head, therefore it's information. And the only thing you can do is either believe it or not believe it. Same as with flat earth, you didn't go out and see ships at the horizon and see if you see the mast before you see the, bolt, the, the hull of the ship, then the earth is round. No, you've never done that. You've never been there on, on the beach trying to uh, recognize whether the horizon is a flat line or a round line, whether you think, see things differently, no. But the moment you add to the process of reading and absorbing that information, the links, and you start clicking on the links, then you are initiating a process. It's a derivative process. It's not as good as your expertise and trying to fire synapses and connections in your head because you already know where to place the knowledge of COVID within your knowledge of the biology of the body, the, your knowledge of other illnesses. It's not as good as that. But the moment you start clicking links, think of Wikipedia, right? I read something, I don't understand it, I click on something else, etc., etc. Then you are restoring the condition to higher levels of knowledge, which is the existence of a process, the existence of a context, the establishing of connections, right? So when you start clicking on the links, then you're building a network of knowledge. You're elevating what is information of the first level or of the fifth level in the orders of knowledge, but you are lifting it, that information up to a different level and from that point of view, even a self-diagnosis might be possible if you travel enough links, if you study, if you learn. So it's not possible in five minutes, it's not possible in an hour, but it might be possible in six months or a year, right? If you're in the medical field, you might know about Lorenzo's oil, right? There's this remedy that was found by the father of a kid with a disability who studied the illness, it was a rare condition, and experimented and read and, and ultimately found a remedy, something that restored part of the lost uh, capacities. Well, it's slightly more complex than that. And you find a few examples of people who even outside of the expertise of their field had great discoveries, right? So links is, what gives value to Google, the fact that you have a multiplicity of links in the list of hits, which is why Google will not just give you one result, even when it is the best result and the only result. It's always a multiplicity of links, of pages. And within the pages that you arrive at from Google, you will, at this point, unavoidably, in inevitably, find links 
And if you start clicking, then you start restoring the level of knowledge or getting closer, approximating a higher level of knowledge. Otherwise, keep this in mind. Whatever you find is just simple information, whether it's about the arrival of a flight or the existence of God or the law of relativity is just information of the first level. That's why they call it big data. Well, there are other reasons, but we can uh, get away with that also. Of course, talking about big data, big data is the keyword to the knowledge industry, the knowledge society, etc. The idea that the sciences of the past were based on sampling the data. You couldn't really test to no end before reaching a conclusion as long as your sample of tests and sample of data was correct and relevant then you could reach a reliable conclusion from there you get to the idea that you need to expand what your collection of data can be to the point where these days scientific articles often come with the publication of a text and the publication of a link to a repository where all the data leading to those conclusions from the article can be accessed. So even Stony Brook for the past few years has had servers made available to scientists and scholars in general where I can place the data that uh, prompted my research and my conclusions after, of course, I, I published that because there is competition among uh, scholars. This is an example of the opposite, which I think is interesting and not difficult to follow. Small data has regained some of its lost prestige in uh, the last few years after this emphasis, this infatuation with big data. And you have this interesting book by Martin Lindstrom, uh, where he talks about Lego, the, the toy maker, right, the, the Lego bricks, and how based on their big data on their customers, they were about to take another route. Uh, they, they, they were basically not growing or even losing part of their market 20 years ago. Uh, and the assumption based on big data was we need to simplify the kits, the kits we, we sell and small data send them in the opposite direction where they are now, right? You enter a Lego store, you, you go into a Lego store. I, I use Lego a lot as a kid, and I, I still go into Lego stores, and sometimes I buy uh, things, and what is that you find? You find that the adult section is even bigger than the kids section, and you find that you have Lego kits for Star Wars uh, uh, starships or uh, cars, or uh, complicated machinery, or the Colosseum. And, and you have kits that have 1,000 pieces, 2,000 pieces, 4,000 pieces. And yet Lego is making more money than they used to. What is what, what was that? It was the result of small data, the study <coughs> of specific cases of users that alerted them to what the culture of their base of their customer base, of their community of user was, and how you would leverage their psychology, their mindset, to cater to uh, repeat customers. And therefore, instead of simplifying the kids as their big data was suggesting, they made their kids more complicated and made more money that way. And you can read more details from these excerpts on the class website. This I already mentioned, and you can read yourself again. Are you familiar with advanced searches? It's kind of basic, but a lot of people don't use all the power that is uh, inside Google and a Google search. Uh, they, they don't exploit it to their best advantage, right? So normally you just type. You just type something and you get results. Uh, they used to have different kinds of codes, so you could put a plus in front of a word to say 
whatever you find me, this word has to be there, and then it became deprecated. But you can still exclude a word or a series of words, right, with minuses. The most useful is using quotes, because quotes around a word or around a phrase will tell Google, don't give me synonyms, just give me examples of pages where this exact word, this exact phrase is found. Even more useful is when you use stars and asterisks. Now, these things don't work the same all the time. They change, they adjust, they calibrate differently. So depending on the period, you can put anything from one asterisk or star up to five, and sometimes beyond three, it will not work. Once again, because they change their interface either for the whole community or just for select users to test the results and see whether they should modify this feature, keep it, change it, uh, get rid of it. What does it mean? If you don't put spaces, here with spaces, but without spaces, it means give me any instance where I find the first word, the last word, and in between, it'll be either zero or one other word, okay? So, for example, if you're studying a foreign language, this will give you the right preposition to use in a particular context. How do you say, I go to church in Italian? Vado a chiesa? No, vado in chiesa. How do I find that? Vado, asterisk, chiesa, and I see the patterns, right? But this has infinite application. If you put spaces, then instead of saying zero or one, one or two, it'll be a few words in between. So it'll be usually, again, depending on how they calibrate, it'll be between one and three, one and four, one and five, or they might just reject your request and not show you anything, even though you know that they have examples, just because that day the servers are calibrated not to offer that kind of functionality to the entire base or just to you as a particular customer, okay? These are some examples and you find more about the searches in here. So you know that capitalization is ignored, punctuation is ignored, uh, and they don't use normally stop words. Stop words would be the words that you don't want to index in a textual database such as the, of, in, etc because they don't have much uh, semantic content, special characters like a tilde, etc. However, accented characters are not always ignored. So the difference between cafe and cafe, depending on whether you write it with an E or with an E with an accent on top, uh, can produce different results at times. Again, it does vary. The order of the search word, whether or not you put quotation marks count, and you can still use and or not around in capital letters, which is especially useful if you use parentheses also. And with parentheses, you can create groups of words. And there are other things you can use, two dots for a range. And keep in mind that the use of quotations is preferable to and in terms of reliability. Of course, the results, what are the results? Well, first of all, if you are a repeat customer, if you're an obsessive searcher, then they'll stop you. They'll say, show me you're not a robot, because it's clear they're paranoid, they're afraid that someone will fish too much content out of their server. I get that a lot because I'm a compulsive user of Google. Whenever I, I'm working, anything I can think of, I want to explore. I want to see if there is anything I'm missing. But again, I'm not looking for information because I have my network. I'm just looking to expand my network of knowledge. The number of results, that's completely useless. That's bogus. So I don't want to hear another YouTuber saying, I put this word and the results were 130 million. No, they were not. I, I don't know why they do it. It's a relic from the past. In the past, it was reliable. Then, once Google got into the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users, many of them at the same time, they found that even a fraction of a tenth of a second would affect 
the smoothness of the search, and therefore they introduce an estimate. They introduce an algorithm because, of course, they have an actual number. They have all the internet, so they could tell you how many times John F. Kennedy appears in their databases. Exactly. They could say exactly whether it's 1 billion, 100 million, 384,023 times. No. Instead, they will, with an algorithm, calculate the number of results, but that's often wrong by a scale of 10, 100, 1,000, depending on how the servers are calculated. You never have access to all the results, right? Because that's their uh, product, and, and they don't want anyone to steal their thunder. So keep in mind, it's always a subset of what you might find, and they decide what kind of subset. In fact, they usually will not give you the same subset of results every time, even to the same user. They will vary that, because as I said, they customize your search, they randomize it. Of course, results are not entirely random. If you think of the, the set of data about your searches as a map, right? As a ragged map with uneven contours, then they try to overlap your map with maps of similar users. So if they find someone else who does, let's say, 80% of the same searches you do, what is that they also search for that you don't? And so they try to expand around the edges, right? If two profiles are slightly different, then they expand in one direction. Of course, the larger the data set, the more unique you are and the harder it is for them to find new things that you will actually pursue, that you will actually click on. You know that they also have, uh, and this was very popular in the past, besides the search button, the OK button, the feeling lucky button, meaning we'll do it for you. And don't bet your business life on it means that in the past, in the early 2000s, there were businesses that relied on their ranking on Google, right? Uh, especially, uh, a good example would be a famous uh, uh, website that went out of business because Google changed the ranking and they were uh, presenting collection of reviews organized by relevance so they would catch a lot of searches about digital electronic products, and then of course those uh, searches would be directed to this website. The website itself had links to the actual products, and if you bought the products, they would get uh, their, their profit there. They used to be in the first screen of searches of hits, and then from one day to the other, they went down to the 10th page of results. They tried to sue Google to restore their ranking, and, uh, of course, you, you, you cannot win with these colossal companies and their big farms of lawyers. And, and so they, they lost 90% of their business. And the explanations that have been tried for that case was that they were trying to, to implement a kind of vertical searches within the same field, digital products, other products, that Google was not offering at the time. And so Google wanted to exclude them and then work on the same functionality to replace the company. But again, it's the same with Amazon. There are books about the legal issues having to do with Amazon. At this point, there are lawyers specializing in Amazon customers, not customers buying from Amazon, but customers selling on Amazon whose business is affected by how Amazon treats them. And it's difficult because you have to prove that there is an algorithm that is intentionally damaging you with limited access to the knowledge of what goes on behind the scenes. If you want to know more, I, I put a bunch of pages where you can find as many as 50 features connected to searches, uh, different kind of searches. And as I said before, the last part is from a book, French book that was uh, translated into English and was republished, published again as recently as 2018, Google Moi by Barbara Cassin, 
which talks about the imperialism of Google. Now, I don't think this is as relevant as it was 15 years ago. However, the book is a classic in the scholarship about Google. So read the notes and you'll learn about uh, some of these ideas. Uh, I, I think you should know about them and, and you find the excerpts in here. Well, I'll stop and go to the notes about chapter two and spend the last 15 minutes of this class talking about this, okay? Let me circulate the attendance and please, whoever is last, they should bring this back to the table. The last attendance got lost, remained somewhere in here. I didn't realize that I didn't have it on the table. It was not under my eyes, forgot about it. It's gone. As I did with chapter one, I'm trying in a concise way to give you the focal points for your reading so that you can better prepare for the final exam. You know what you're supposed to remember, what you're supposed to associate with other notions from here. In the case of chapter one, I had long excerpts, although altogether we're about four pages. In this case, I have single points because chapter two is comprised of a long series of paragraphs, sections. Some of them are shorter than a page, introducing the terminology and the cultural debates or the history behind the use of those terms. So I'll just go through it as quickly as possible. You stop me if you want me to expand or explain. But again, if you limit yourself to reading this, this will be what? Information, flat, base information. If you combine this with the book, then this becomes the matrix to focus on the most important part. Okay, so here it goes. The concept of authority is very simple to understand. If there is knowledge, knowledge is located in a community, in society, so knowledge is subject to authority. It can be subject to the laws of authority, such as creating a monopoly of knowledge, controlling what is knowledge, censuring or sanctioning what is deemed or labeled illicit knowledge. And, and again, once again, the best example in this case would be the idea of disinformation applied to YouTube videos on COVID or uh, other similar issues that, that we find today, right? The, the attempt to classify knowledge, to exclude knowledge, or to reduce the influence that some uh, knowledge may have on people, on users. If you go back in time, the best examples of authority over knowledge from an early age are found within religion, right? Priests uh, and ministers and the hierarchy, the clergy, the hierarchy of any church from the past to the present is in charge of establishing what is the truth about that religion and administering knowledge in that case, of course, has an impact on the life of the believers. So you can think of the priests in Egypt. The reason why the Pope in Rome is still called a pontiff has to do with the word pontifex, plural pontifices. The pontifex in Rome was a high priest in charge of the blessing of the most important parts of society, what was one of the most important things for a city built around a river such as Rome, making bridges. And the base word for pontifex is pons, pontum, which means a bridge, right? Uh, and, and that's why to this day you call a pope who lives in Rome a pontiff, and then you find the Inquisition, although don't overestimate the power of the Inquisition. It's overdone in movies. Uh, and, and books sometimes, right? But they're clear examples of control of knowledge, authority exercise over knowledge, and you regulate access to knowledge as well, right? And, and access to knowledge is very important in religion. Just keep in mind that the early Christian churches had a setup inside the early churches 
and you see some example, you, you still find an example in Rome, I believe, um, Santa Maria in Trastevere, perhaps. They had a setup that allowed the priest to draw a curtain during the time of the Eucharist because it was considered such a mysterious sacrament, the transformation of the host during the ceremony of the Eucharist into the body, the flesh and the blood of Christ, uh, the, the wine turning into the blood of Christ, that it had to be sh the, the, the believers had to be shielded. Not only that, but in a, in a primitive church from the first few centuries, you would have found also an initial part uh, and then a gate of some kind because the initial part was for the catechumeni, for the people who were not introduced to all the sacraments, who were just initiating their path towards uh, uh, God. And so you, you have different sections, different kinds of access to that kind of knowledge, easy to understand the concept. So the examples are secondary to our understanding. Of course, take even the monks and the scribes, one and the same actually, all those scribes in the convents in Europe who copied the manuscript from ancient Greece and Rome. That's how we have, we don't have as big an amount of books and documents as we have for ancient Rome and ancient Greece. Why? Well, because no piece of paper or parchment or animal skin can survive for thousands of years. At best, we have fragments of the Bibles, right? With one or two verses, or we have the copies from the first century, right? But in the case of the Romans and the Greeks, we have copies of copies of texts from 2,500 years ago. And all those were copied by the monks onto fresh manuscripts, right? And when they, those manuscripts decayed, they copied them onto other manuscripts. Of course, this is a form of monopoly because they decided what was to be preserved and copied. And in fact, sometimes they would, from one generation of monks to another, decide, oh, this is a treatise on math by Pythagoras. Eh, not relevant to me. So they would scrap, sc scrape the ink from the parchment, and then write on it. But, but of course, modern scholars have been able to read what was partially erased, but not completely erased. Okay, so, monopoly. And of course, university scholars and professors have that kind of power. The best way to understand is the nickname, the label for a long time given to uh, professors by uh, students and colleagues in Italy, Baroni means barons, meaning that your uh, area of study is like a fifth zone. You have power. Not only you decide what is published, you decide who gets a chair in a university. And in many systems, Italy is a good example, Germany is another example, to a degree even the US, who gets a position, a job in an American university? Not just anyone. It's not based on expertise. It depends on your position in the field, right? What is that you propose? What is your view of the future of that field? Who are you associated with? Because there is a politics in academia, political side to that. And of course, any kind of dictatorship is based on the control of knowledge, right? Other term, curiosity. The best part of this chapter is probably the passages on curiosity, right? Because in, in simple terms, it gives you an idea of the complexity of the history of the language because curious curiosity had and still have very ambiguous meaning, right? Because you can be curious because you're inquisitive, but the idea, they say, oh, curious is also to inspire caution, right? To define something that is not clear and out of the ordinary and dangerous, therefore, right? And also, you have curious in the sense of something that is very strange, very odd, or even exotic, to the point where you have curious stores in some English-speaking countries. Uh, 
you had in the 18th century and 19th century the cabinets of curiosity, the Wunderkammer in, in, in German. Actually, I believe there should be an umlaut over the U, where exotic animals, strange objects, strange archaeological artifacts uh, would be collected, perhaps the tooth of a dinosaur, right, uh, etc. And in fact, this, even in philosophy, even in official uh, field of knowledge, is reflected. Curiosity was positive for Aristotle, a good quality to have, negative for one of the founders of Christian religion, such as Augustine. Why? Because, of course, when you take religion, everything is a mystery. Why, why did God willed evil into existence? Why does God allow the innocent to suffer? Why do we have earthquakes? Why do children perish before they can do anything? Well, what's their sin? What's their, what are they being punished for? Everything subjected to excessive scrutiny can become dangerous. So Augustine says, don't be too curious. Trust God and don't worry about finding the answers to everything, right? Then of course, during the Renaissance, curiosity becomes once again a good thing and from the Enlightenment, from the age of the French Revolution uh, to today, curiosity is seen as positive in a dominant way. Of course, disciplines is how you organize knowledge, but it's also a reductionist approach, right? Scientification means that these days any discipline has to follow some kind of scientific principles. But is that really convenient? Is that really this kind of homogeneity? Is that positive? Does everything have to become scientific? And I witnessed that process when I went to the university, it was the first year was 1982. That was the period of transition where even in the humanities or the study of literature, the word scientific was used a lot. This is a scientific study of the divine comedy, scientific because it is based on the historical and textual analysis of the material evidence surrounding the contents of the divine comedy, etc. It, it's kind of a bias. You introduce a bias, right? And when is the disciplines became separate from each other? During the Middle Ages, or even the age of Aristotle, Aristotle does biology, does nature, does medicine, does ethics, does politics. He does everything, and this was pretty much the case for scholars and intellectuals up until the Renaissance. Then the Renaissance says, no, no, no. You have to become an expert of a separate area, and each area has to be based on their own principles, and that's when you have philology born, linguistics born, and the birth of uh, political science, etc. And what happens with this separation? Take Machiavelli, my first class in the morning. Uh, political science, according to Machiavelli, cannot be about morality, right? Machiavelli is not like Machiavelli defended evil practices in politics. He just said something that looks evil from the point of view of religion or morality may be expedient or necessary in politics. If you do it because you are an evil leader, then sooner or later you will become a loser. But even if you're honest, at some point you might have to take some decisions that will involve suffering, right? A president might decide on sending troops to a mission where he knows some will die, or a president might decide uh, that a citizen, uh, especially a non-American citizen, has to die for the welfare, for the well-being of, uh, of, of the American state, uh, the American society, etc. So there is a necessity associated with that. So Machiavelli separates the study of politics from morality, theology, religion, sociology, and says what is true here in this book called The Prince is true within the boundaries of the study of politics. I'm not pretending to be all, to provide all the answers, but I'm not going to get involved with God or theology because those things rarely have anything to do with politics. 